Bartlett, the head librarian of the Society Library, and uh, welcome to our special afternoon reception and a lecture and talk by Brian J. Jones on Washington Irving, one of the library's former trustees. We have a drink, uh, both cool drink and warm drink. There's coffee, lemonade, and we will be having a cake cutting after uh, Brian's uh, talk to help us end our National Library Week celebration that we've been doing this year at the library, and I believe for the first time ever, our library has joined in on a uh, national celebration that happens in libraries of all types, and um, we're really happy to be finishing this week with celebrating a former member and a very important man of letters. For those of you who don't know, most of you are members, but for those of you who don't know, our library goes back to 1754, back when the word society that's in our name now meant something very different. It did not really have connotations of class. Um, we bought books to basically uh, build a collection of books for people to borrow to improve the lives of New Yorkers. We're here 254 years later, believe it or not. Um, in my job, I, I sometimes laugh and sometimes smile when I get to tell people I'm the 18th in a string of librarians. So uh, I guess it means by the time I leave here, I'll have very gray hair. Um, Irving was a trustee of the library from 1835 to 1837, and that's when the library was in its second home at 33 Nassau Street. The city was home to about 300,000 people. In 1838, we published one of our catalogs, which in that day was a bound book that listed our books in the collection, and we had 25,000 volumes. Irving is represented in our library archives in a few places, and this week we had uh, a great little discovery yesterday afternoon of opening up one of the charging ledgers from uh, the time that Irving was a member of our library. And today outside we have one of the ledgers on display just beside the exhibition cases, and it shows a set of books that he borrowed uh, during uh, one year, and you can have a look through what he was reading. Uh, Irving is one of a long tradition of member writers of our library, Herman Melville, uh, illustrator Maxfield Parrish, Henry James, Willa Cather, and in more modern days, Barbara Tuckman, Tom Wolfe, um, Wendy Wasserstein, Del David Halberstam, Robert Carroll, many, many people. Our speaker this afternoon is Brian J. Jones. He will be speaking about Irving and sharing uh, some elements of his new book, Washington Irving, an American Original, published by Arcade Publishing. Brian was born in Kansas City and raised in New Mexico, and his career includes serving for nearly 10 years as a speechwriter, ghostwriter, and policy analyst in the United States Senate. He now works as a writer and policy analyst, and he lives with his family in Damascus, Maryland. Please welcome Brian J. Jones. Thank everybody for coming out to this really famous place, um, especially on a day that's so nice out there, and I know you're probably also fighting Pope traffic, so I appreciate you coming out today. Um, Irving himself, as he said, did a lot of his own reading in this library, uh, a lot of his own research. Among, there's a document out here that dates from 1837. There's also one um, from November 1809. Uh, Irving was on the list of about 40 subscribers to the library at the time, and that would have been around the time Irving was doing his research for a history of New York, so that falls right in line with what he would have been working on. Um, at the, it, he actually writes about this library in the history of New York, but he calls it City Library in there. He later became a trustee, and he was on the library committee at that time. So, so I can honestly say it's a very uh, thrilling to be here, and it's even more of an honor to be here for National Library Week, so I appreciate that. When I mention the name Washington Irving, uh, chances are our audience is either one, I think I'm talking about a basketball player, <laughs> Two, they don't know who he is. Or three, they generally know who he is, but they can't name anything he's written. Yet two of his most famous stories, Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, have become such an ingrained part of our American DNA that most people can give you the summary of both stories even if you've never read it. Um, but in his time, Irving was one of the most famous men in the whole world. Um, if he were alive today, he would be a regular feature in gossip magazines. Um, he was famous not just for his work, but for his personality and for the people that he was affiliated with. Uh, his life would have been the stuff of an E! True Hollywood story. Uh, he had a knack for going to the most fashionable parties and events. Um, he had the most fashionable friends. 
And he always seemed to be in the middle um, of some of the most extraordinary world-changing events as they were happening. He was a celebrity unlike anything we even got today. He was one of our first, if not the first, genuine American superstars. Uh, he had movie star good looks before there were movies. He was a first-rate conversationalist. Uh, his name alone was enough to sell books uh, and generate press. Politicians fell all over themselves to be affiliated with him. Fans mobbed him wherever he went. They flooded his home with requests for his autograph, for cuttings from his trees, for scraps of his blotting paper. Uh, his image was in constant demand. He worked very hard, though, to protect his private life. He was fiercely protective of his public reputation and his private life, which were two separate things. Uh, he was everything we expect celebrities today to be. Uh, but even in today's celebrity-centric culture, there still isn't really anybody quite like him. But he made it look very easy, and uh, the trappings of fame have become such an accepted part uh, of our view of movie stars and celebrities and famous people. Um, and I would argue that authors at that time were sort of the equivalent of movie stars then. But we've all forgotten that Washington Irving kind of did all that first. Uh, even in his own time, people seem to forget that he was an innovator. Edgar Allan Poe once privately admitted that he considered Irving much overrated. Uh, here's what Poe says. A nice distinction might be drawn between his just and surreptitious and adventitious reputation, between what is due to the pioneer solely and what to the writer. But what skeptics like Poe didn't seem to appreciate is that going first also meant going it alone. Irving had no role models uh, for how one manages an image or a reputation or how one deals with the press. Irving had to fend for himself, and he had to improvise. So with that in mind, then, I want to spend this afternoon uh, looking at how Washington Irving went about improvising his most unique American life. Uh, it's a who's who of the best of 19th century art and literature and politics, and I think you'll agree it's an extraordinary life. So even before Irving was famous, uh, he had a knack for finagling invitations to the finest parties. Uh, it was a skill he had honed during a two-year stay in Europe as a young man, a young 20-something, in 1804 he would have been about 20, 21. Um, and he could always manage to show up at someone's house just as the roast chicken was being put on the table. <laughs> but in 1811, he crashed the ultimate party, a White House social that was hosted by First Lady Dolly Madison. No invitation, no problem. I swore by all my gods I would be there, Irving said, and thus he was. He loved Mrs. Madison. He said of her, Mrs. Madison is a fine, portly, buxom dame who has a smile and a pleasant word for everybody. But compared with his outgoing hostess, unfortunately, first wallflower James Madison didn't compare so well. As to Jemmy Madison, Irving says, ah, poor Jemmy, he is but a withered little apple john. Irving would become a friend uh, and admirer of both the president and the first lady. Uh, the president, in fact, was a fan of Irving's. Uh, Irving said, the president pronounced me a promising young man, uh, but that I talk too much. And that was probably an understatement. Uh, but unfortunately, Irving had to put parties and America behind him in 1815. He left for England, uh, at first just for kind of a change of venue, but he was immediately forced to shoulder the burdens of a family business that was quickly going bankrupt. Uh, it was humiliating work, uh, but Irving still found time to travel the countryside widely. Uh, he even managed, of course, to secure a letter of invitation to his idol, the romantic poet uh, Walter Scott. Uh, late in 1817, Irving shows up on Scott's doorstep uh, of Scott's uh, castle. It's sort of Castle Home Abbotsford, which is still standing. He is welcomed warmly by Sir Walter. Well, I wasn't sorry yet. He is welcomed warmly by Scott. Uh, and during those days, he and Scott cemented a friendship that would last until Scott's death 15 years later. And Irving said of Scott, I came prepared to admire him, but he completely won my heart and made me love him. Uh, the days thus spent, I shall ever look back to as among the very happiest of my life for I was conscious at the time of being happy. But Sir Walter Scott was a Irving fan and convert. He said, one of the best and pleasantest acquaintances I have made many a day. So Scott, in fact, would play a key role uh, in making Irving's name. Following the failure of the family business, uh, Irving had to remain in England to try his hand at writing. Uh, he was working on a series of essays. And in 1819, he began publishing these essays simultaneously in the United States and England. This is the way you protected your copyright. Uh, it was actually a brilliant move on Irving's part. He was one of the first to figure out that if he published both in the United States and England, somebody couldn't get your book in the United States, come across the ocean, and publish it without you getting any profits. So Irving did that in the bud by printing them in both countries at the same time. 
Um, so he calls this series of essays uh, The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cran Gentleman. It's the book we know or invest more, which has Ben Penwinkle in it, it's got the legend of Sleepy Hollow in it. But Irving had only just begun producing these essays when his publisher suddenly goes bankrupt and takes the sketchbook down with him. Well, Irving appeals to Sir Walter Scott for help, and Scott encourages his own publisher, John Murray, who was the British powerhouse publisher at the time, uh, and had, Murray had actually previously blown off Irving, in fact, that said he didn't want to publish it. But Scott convinced Murray to take up the book. And uh, Murray, of course, had the luxury of stepping in and being offered this book now after The Legend of Sleepy Hollow had just been published. So with the weight of uh, Murray's imprint behind him and Murray's promotion, uh, Irving's book explodes upon the public. Irving, like Byron before him, and Byron was also a client of John Murray's, uh, literally woke up in the morning and found himself famous. Uh, here's what Irving said. I am astonished at the success of my writings in England and can hardly persuade myself that it is all not a dream. Had anyone told me a few years since in America that anything I could write would interest such men as Lord Byron, I should have readily believed a fairy tale. Well, Irving becomes the toast of London. He becomes his host of Europe. Uh, he was an oddity, in fact. He was an upstart American who had the nerve to write decent English. Um, he was, in the minds of many people, the finest British writer America had ever produced. <laughs> But he had done something else very clever with the sketchbook. He had so blended the lines between author and pseudonym that many readers were convinced he really was the well-read, well-traveled, and very clever Jeffrey Crayon. Uh, and for the nervous, generally unfocused, insecure Washington Irving, that was just fine. And he was going to work to make sure it stayed that way. So the image management begins now. Uh, Irving's friend, the artist Charles Leslie, begins working on a portrait of Irving. And Irving was adamant that Leslie not paint him in clothing that might in a few years, and this is Irving's word, I love this, appear stupid. <laughs> Irving writes him and says, no Venetian cloaks or capes and corners and angles, but rather let the costume be simple and picturesque, but such a one as a gentleman might be supposed to wear occasionally at the present day. <laughs> so Irving's smashed, but the pressure of success uh, is almost more than he can handle. He's desperate now for a follow-up. His publisher is pressing him to go again. Well, Irving develops a massive case of writer's block now. So he travels all over Europe trying to uh, shake his writer's block, settle down, find inspiration. Uh, he continues to be feted wherever he goes, and he's also broke. He had a knack for making poor investments. Uh, he's lost a lot of his money on a risky steamboat endeavor. Uh, most of these endeavors were encouraged by his brother Peter. But Irving knew his name was enough to sell. He said, uh, any book I should now offer for sale, good or bad, would be sure to find a ready publisher at a high price among the booksellers. Uh, and he was right. The follow-up book, finally, Bracebridge Hall, which he also released under the Jeffrey Crayon name, was a hit, and Irving Bass in another round of success. He's now officially the writer of note. Uh, his name and influence can make or break a book. In 1822, he's approached by an American publisher in London, who's looking for help in securing a British publisher for a book he just published. Uh, it's a Revolutionary War era espionage novel called The Spy. Uh, it's written by a 32-year-old New Yorker named James Fenimore Cooper. So Irving goes to John Murray, and to his annoyance, Murray says no. Well, nonetheless, Cooper sends Irving a note of thanks, and then asks Irving help for securing help with another book he's got called The Pioneers, which is the first book in the Leatherstocking Tales. Well, this time, Murray's a little more impressed, and at Irving's behest, agrees to publish Cooper's novel. This marks the beginning of a professional relationship between Irving and Cooper that would swing between warm and absolutely frigid over the next four decades. So now Irving's next book, Tales of a Traveler, incredibly derivative of his previous work. Uh, it's yet another series of sketches by Jeffrey Cram, bombs with the critics. They accuse Irving of going to the wall one too many times. Reviews are bad, but even worse, the reviewers now have the nerve to badmouth him. No man in the Republic of Letters, says the New York Mirror, has been more overrated than Mr. Washington Irving. Well, off Irving goes into spin mode. I have no allies among the scribblers for the periodical press, he says. However, as I do not read criticism, good or bad. I am out of reach of the attack. If my writings are worth anything, they will outlive temporary criticism. If they are not, worth caring about. Well, that was a lie. <laughs> Irving read every word his critics ever wrote, and any criticism hurt him terribly. 
Uh, any writer who's been told it takes a thick skin uh, to read the critics can thank Washington Irving for going there first, because Washington Irving had remarkably thin skin. Uh, bad reviews gave him stomach cramps, they gave him insomnia, and more than anything, they completely sapped his motivation to work. Worse, at this time, he's picked up a sort of literary stalker who takes great delight in clipping his bad reviews in the United States and sending them off to him in Europe. <laughs> uh, so, well, Irving uh, would put, put his view of critics best in later years. In, in a private letter to a strange interview report, he says, to me, it is always ten times more gratifying to be liked than to be admired. That, perhaps, as much, of any, as much as anything could probably be Washington Irving's epitaph, to be liked rather than admired. But to his surprise, in the summer of 1825, he finds out that he is liked, uh, though probably not in a manner he's expecting. His friend John Howard Payne, uh, the playwright, informs him that a young widow that Payne's been wooing in London uh, is not interested in Payne because she's much more interested in dating Payne's handsome friend, Washington Irving. The young widow was Mary Shelley, uh, the widow of the poet Shelley and the author Frankenstein. Well, Irving had met Mrs. Shelley several times before. She, he'd seen her at the theater in some of the boxes at the, at the theater. But it was clear that he had made an impression on her. For she says, uh, Payne, Payne writes to Irving and says, She said you had interested her more than anyone she had seen since she left Italy, that you were gentle and cordial, and that she longed for friendship with you. So Mrs. Shelley asks Payne for copies of Irving's letters to read, which Payne provides, in order to get to know Irving better. Distance makes this relationship hard because Irving's in Paris and she's in London. Uh, but Mrs. Shelley jokes that uh, it's taking too long to consummate this relationship now. She says her plans to marry Washington Irving are proceeding far too slowly. She says, me thinks our acquaintance proceeds at the rate of the antediluvians, who, I have somewhere read, thought nothing of an interval of a year or two between a visit. Alas, I fear that at this rate, if ever the church should make us one, it would be announced in the consolatory phrase that the bride and bridegroom's joint ages to the discrete number of 145 years and three months. <laughs> well, Mrs. Shelley was very embarrassed by that, this, writing this letter, and as Payne prepares to leave for Paris to visit Irving, she goes running over to him, gives him a note, and says, please speak well of me to Mr. Irving, and for God's sake, don't mention the antediluvians. <laughs> so Payne meets up with Irving in Paris, and he clearly thinks this is a golden opportunity for Washington Irving. He says, I, shall, I do not ask you to fall in love. But I should feel a little proud of myself if you thought the lady worthy of that distinction. Well, the thought of Irving and Shelley as uh, a literary power couple is dazzling. But Irving, still sulking in Paris at this time, was in no mood to encourage Mrs. Shelley. Read Mrs. Shelley's correspondence before going to bed, he noted in his journal, the only words he ever wrote. Uh, Irving could be frustratingly enigmatic. So Irving may have looked like the world's most successful writer to the outside world, uh, who likely pictured him living life to the finest. But in truth, again, he's almost perpetually broke. Uh, if he's going to make any money, he needs to write. Fortunately, at this point, he's not called to Spain by the American minister in Spain, Alexander Hill Everett, who asks Irving if he wants to come to Madrid to translate uh, some of the journals of Christopher Columbus that they've recently found. So Irving jumps at this opportunity. Well, he gets there, and the task is not what Everett has explained to him. It involves translating 900 pages of sort of obscure Spanish government documents. Uh, so Irving shelves that project, but instead, as he looks through them, he finds a little more inspiration for a number of new books. So going through the libraries in, in Madrid, um, he sort of finds his muse again, finally. Uh, as he looks through old history books and Spanish libraries, he begins multitasking, which is remarkable for Washington Irving. He starts working on several books at once. Uh, he's working on a biography of Christopher Columbus, a history of Grenada, uh, even a biography of the prophet Muhammad. And his work ethic impresses at least one new arrival in Madrid, a 20-year-old aspiring poet named Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. At this point, Longfellow is just a traveling professor of modern languages. Uh, but he's already an Irving fan. Uh, Longfellow later said, Every reader has his first book, one book among all others which in early youth first fascinates his imagination and at once excites and satisfies the desires of his mind. To me, the first book was the sketchbook of Washington Irving. Well, for the few weeks that Longfellow's in Madrid, Irving makes an effort to socialize frequently with him, perhaps remembering the same sort of time that uh, Walter Scott invested in him. And Longfellow was delighted with the time and attention he's getting. He said of Irving, he is one of those men who puts you at ease in a moment. Uh, and Longfellow indeed would remain a long, lifelong admirer of Irving's and a friend. So Irving eventually settles in the Moorish Castle Alhambra, 
in Grenada, and here membership has its privileges. His fame allows him to live actually within the castle, uh, and Irving's walking among the trees and smelling the flowers and looking for inspiration and just having the time of his life, and receives word that President Jackson has appointed him secretary to the American Embassy in London under Minister Louis McLean. Well, it breaks his heart because he wanted to stay in the Alhambra, but off he goes to London. McLean's ch primary chore in London is to negotiate the West Indies trade issue. Uh, it's a port that had been off limits to the Americans since the American Revolution. And McLean needs a good secretary now. He needs somebody who can not only write well, but who's familiar with London, who can socialize easily, who can maneuver effectively among the British government officials and nobility. And Secretary of State Martin Van Buren back in the United States says, you know, I think I have an ideal candidate and a fellow New Yorker here and puts the name of Washington Irving before President Jackson and Congress, where it's quickly approved. Well, it's a shrewd decision because ministers, government officials, and nobility all open their doors to McLean and his American celebrity sidekick here. And Irving says, I have received repeated expressions of kindness and goodwill from various officers of the government who have taken occasion to express their satisfaction at my having been appointed to the legation. Well, he and McLean very quickly land their deal, and then things start to get really interesting. Internal squabbling causes President Jackson's cabinet to implode, and when the dust settles, McLean is hightailing it back to the United States uh, to take a cabinet position. Martin Van Buren is now on his way to London to assume the post of American minister. Washington Irving, however, resigns his position. He's much more interested now in writing than in politics, although he vows that he'll stay on board long enough to help Van Buren get settled. So Irving and Van Buren move in together. Irving and Van Buren are both New Yorkers, and they're only four months apart in age. Uh, and they felt a, a genuinely warm friendship. Um, apart from a personal fondness from Ir for Irving, Van Buren uh, quickly recognized that Irving's resignation was actually a loss to the legation. And this gives you an idea of some of the DC conversations that may have gone on when you hear Van Buren writing to Jackson. He says, an intimate acquaintance with Irving has satisfied me that I was mistaken in supposing that his literary occupation had given his mind a turn unfavorable to practical business pursuits. So far from it, I have been both disappointed and pleased to find in him not only great capacity, but an active and untiring disposition for the prompt and successful charge of business. Well, Irving, too, takes to Van Buren immediately. Irving says, I do not wonder you should all be so fond of him. His manners are most amiable and ingratiating, and I have no doubt he will become a favorite at this court, and will continue those amicable relations you have so advantageously established. Well, the U.S. Senate had other ideas about that. In late February, as Irving and Van Buren are sitting at breakfast, Van Buren receives word that the United States Senate, in a partisan squabble, has rejected his nomination as American minister. Well, counseling a dejected Van Buren over breakfast, uh, Irving rightly tells Van Buren that he believes the move will turn Van Buren into a political martyr. Van Buren asks Irving whether, in defiance, he should continue to go to the meetings. Should I, should I continue to meet with all the ministers? Should I continue to meet with the king? And Irving, in a remarkably astute uh, advice, says this. I advised him to take the field and show himself. Everyone seemed to understand and sympathize in his case. This I consider an earnest of the effect that will be produced by the same cause in the United States. I should not be surprised if this vote of the Senate goes far towards ultimately elevating him to the presidential chair. Well, so much for those who said Irving had no political instincts at all. In the end, Irving proved himself a capable politician, a very shrewd negotiator, and when the legation was left in his hands for a while, even a shrewd administrator. But in 1832, Irving finally returns home to the United States after 17 years abroad. He was brought ashore reluctantly by the paparazzi. He uh, was picked up by a newsboat dispatched by the New York Courier, who had been tipped off that Irving's ship was stranded just off Sandy Hook, New Jersey, by a headwind. And he's given a hero's welcome uh, and invited to multiple, multiple dinners in his honor. And Irving, who dreaded public speaking, please remember that, Irving hates public speaking, turns down every dinner invitation except, except the one in New York, um, where the hometown crowd roars happily at every stuttered syllable Irving can finally get out of his mouth. In 1835, Irving acquires his own home at the age of 52, finally has a home of his own, uh, where his fame causes him some more problems as he's working to seal the deal to buy this house. He advised family acting on his behalf not to let the property owners know it was him who was making the queries or he feared they would raise the price. Uh, to his disgust, his queries were still leaked to the newspapers, uh, though Irving still managed to get the property for close to the price he was, he was hoping for. 
This is the property that he would build and renovate uh, into the beautiful cottage Sunnyside, which is still standing today near Terrytown, just up river. I encourage you all to visit Sunnyside if you have the opportunity. Sunnyside, however, was a money pit. It consumed his money. It required him to publish or perish. So Irving cranks out a number of what we now call his American books. Um, perhaps the most notable at that time was Astoria, which, looking at the titles of the books out here, I think he was doing some research on that. Uh, Astoria is a gushing portrayal of zillionaire John Jacob Astor, who is a friend and admirer of Irving. And Astor had personally tapped Irving to be his biographer. Well, that sort of ingratiating was way too much for another famous American, James Fenimore Cooper. He is to be Astor's biographer, Cooper says, <laughs> Columbus and John Jacob Astor. I dare say Irving will make the last the greatest man. In 1836, Irving's friend Martin Van Buren is elected president. Irving and Van Buren kept up their correspondence at the time. Irving remained the writer every politician wants to be associated with. Tammany Hall Democrats at one point approach Irving and say, we want you to run for mayor of New York. Uh, Irving says, of course I decline. Months later, he beat back another demand to run for Congress. He said, I must run mad first. But it wasn't just politicians who were seeking Irving's endorsement at the time. So too did American writers. Uh, who filled Irving's mail with short stories, scraps of poetry, descriptions of novels, hoping, begging, Washington Irving for a kind word. Well, one of the most ingratiating was a young writer named Edgar Allan Poe, who, behind flattering cover letters, provided Irving with copies of The Fall of the House of Usher and William Wilson. Irving's tastes in literature were old school. He was not well-equipped to respond to Poe's darker genius, but he gives it his all. He reads both tales and gives Poe his comments. He says, you know, this, this William Wilson's great stuff. This, uh, this House of Usher, uh, it needs to, he says, it might be improved by relieving the style from some of the epithets. So Irving likes William Wilson, not this House of Usher stuff, but that's enough for Poe. Poe uh, goes back to his potential publishers and tells one of them, I am sure you will be pleased to hear that Washington Irving has addressed me two letters <laughs> abounding in high passages of compliment in regard to my tales. Irving's name will afford me a complete triumph over those little critics who would endeavor to put me down by raising hue and cry of exaggeration in style of Germanism and such twaddle. <laughs> well, while Poe admired and envied Irving, as I mentioned earlier, he thought Irving's talents had always been undeservedly magnified. Publicly, however, Poe was very careful to maintain a respectful attitude and though Pope believed otherwise, Irving was a staunch champion and defender of America's maturing literature. He advocated for changes in copyright law to protect uh, their livelihoods and encourage Americans to become writers. He said, we have a young literature springing up and daily unfolding itself with wonderful energy and luxuriance, which deserves all its fostering care. Uh, unfortunately, the legislation he was advocating for did not pass. But, um, but Irving was also a fan of British writers. Uh, he was particularly fond of Charles Dickens who in 1840 was in the midst of serializing the old curiosity shop uh, in British magazines that Irving read at Sunnyside. Irving was such a big fan of Dickens, in fact, that he wrote the 29-year-old Dickens a fan letter, expressing his admiration for Dickens' writing. Well, for Dickens, who was a lifelong Irving fan, Irving, uh, Dickens at one point claimed he had worn out his own copy of the History of New York. This is the equivalent of the master blessing to protege, similar again to Irving's relationship with Walter Scott. Dickens, in fact, is no casual fan of Irving. As it's clear in his letters, he knows Irving's work inside and out. He says, There is no living writer, and there are very few among the dead, whose approbation I should feel so proudly to earn, he told Irving. I have been so accustomed to associate you with my pleasantest and happiest thoughts, and with my leisure hours, that I rush at once into full confidence with you, and fall, as it were, naturally, and by the very laws of gravity, into your open arms. <laughs> Well, Irving's so taken with Dickens that he does something out of the ordinary with that literary correspondence. Irving writes back. And he says, In general, I seek no acquaintances and keep up no correspondence. But towards you, there was a strong impulse, which for some time I resisted, but which at length overpowered me. In fact, in late October, when Charles Dickens informed Irving that he's coming to America on a reading tour, Irving's practically vibrating with anticipation of this. He invites Dickens and his wife to stay with him at Sunnyside, and then, believe it or not, agrees to speak at a dinner in Dickens' honor in New York. Well, while well-intentioned, 
Irving uh, prepares his remarks days in advance. Irving botches it. Part of the problem is he leaves his remarks under his plate when he stands up. But the crowd is with him, and they cheer him on as best they can, and all he finally manages to get out is, Charles Dickens, guest of the nation! <laughs> Sits back down, and he says, There, I told you I should break down, and I have done it! <laughs> Dickens, however, adores Irving, loves the speech, and praises Irving with enthusiasm in his own remarks. Here's Dickens. I came to this city eager to see him, and here he sits. <laughs> I need not tell you how happy and delighted I am to see him here tonight in this capacity. Washington Irving! Well, he continued in typical Dickensian eloquence, and the room, of course, explodes into applause when they're done. Uh, again, a genuine affection between Dickens and Irving. Well, in 1840, Irving has a vocal and very public falling out with Mark Van Buren. In a disagreement primarily over Van Buren's failure to provide a public appointment for Irving's brother, Ebenezer. In a snip, Irving declares that Van Buren, quote, betrayed heartlessness in friendship and low-mindedness in politics, and therefore, I determined to abstain from voting for him. So Irving publicly throws his weight and considerable clout behind William Henry Harrison and his new Whig party in 1840. One, Van Buren loses. It's enough to get Irving noticed by the Whigs now, and their new president, following the death of Harrison, of course, John Tyler, is finally the first politician to successfully tap into Irving's popularity to score political points. Citing his work on the Spanish books and Irving's fluence in Spanish, uh, John Tyler appoints Irving minister to Spain. Irving accepts. Uh, he does so mainly for the minister's salary, which is so pouring into improvements at Sunnyside. Um, but he also thought it would be kind of a writing retreat. He believes he's going to finally have the ability to have some time to unzone and start writing again. It's a typical coup. Uh, it's a political coup for John Tyler. Henry Clay, receiving the nomination, says, Ah, this is a nomination everyone will concur in. If the president would send us such names as this, we should never have any difficulty. So Irving's nomination sails through the Senate. Irving was a good minister, though. Uh, he was there mainly as a goodwill ambassador, and uh, the goodwill paid off in space for the American government. He was unable to do much writing. He happened to land in Spain right in the middle of a civil war. Um, but his work on Spanish writings from early had earned him considerable goodwill of the Spanish people. Uh, and the ministers in Spain all loved him. Uh, they looked to him as the more experienced statesman, despite the fact he'd never actually been a statesman before. Um, he spoke fluent Spanish, and he was able to impress the court with good manners, which meant a lot. And he had a good respect for protocol. Uh, and he also seemed to be one of the few that really appreciated that Queen Isabella was still merely a child. In lengthy dispatches, he would write to uh, Daniel Webster Irving, would discuss Spain's uh, political unrest, and he would address rumors about the Queen's marriage. He would analyze the latest gossip in Spain and in the Spanish court. Irving is the rarest of creatures here. He's a diplomat with the bestseller. And his official communications are full of thoughtful asides, literary references, colorful descriptions of Spanish uh, politicians, and sort of like a dramatis persona. I mean, it's almost like reading a novel. So it's little wonder, of course, that Secretary of State Daniel Webster was said to immediately put aside all other correspondence when the latest diplomatic uh, letters came in from his minister in Spain. But Irving did do his job well. He kept America in favor, uh, even as the revolving door of generals and political sycophants and conniters kind of made their way to the top of the Spanish hierarchy. Irving was very fond of the queen. Um, and at, 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 one, at one point, he offered to form a human shield of him and his fellow ministers around the queen in case the castle was ever stormed, uh, which fortunately the American government was never made aware of that vote. <laughs> At another point, he was called upon by the uh, minister in London, who just happened to be his old boss, Louis McLean again, to help resolve the dispute with England involving the boundaries of the Oregon territories. He also got to meet the 23-year-old Queen Victoria, who was only five years into what would eventually be her 60-year reign, he was very disappointed with Queen Victoria. He said, her countenance, though not decidedly handsome, is agreeable and intelligent. Sort of like describing a blind date. Uh, he also noted that her mouth tended to hang open. Another morning in London, Irving uh, has breakfast with McLean and McLean's new secretary, a young New Yorker named Danzibort Melville, who chats with Irving about copyright law and gives Irving the first ten chapters of a manuscript that his younger brother is writing about beachcombing in the South Pacific. Well, Irving, Dan Zabort writes later, was much pleased with it. He said the style was very graphic and prophesied its success. A month later, John Murray published Herman Melville's first book, Typee, 
and just as Irving had predicted, it was a success. Well, with the 1844 election of James K. Polk, Irving is convinced, wrongly, that he's going to be replaced as Spanish minister. So beating Polk to a punch that was not going to land, he resigned his post in 1845. It was news that rocked the diplomatic corps, and it rocked the Polk administration. Irving returned home in 1846, though, and he would never leave the country again. Well, back home, he's tapped almost immediately to serve as an executor of John Jacob Astor's will, uh, along with a fee of about $10,000, which is about a quarter of a million dollars today. Much to the annoyance of, <laughs> say it with me, James Fenimore Cooper. <laughs> today, J.J. Astor goes to the tomb. Irving is an executor. And report says, with a legacy of $50,000, what an instinct that man has for gold. Well, as a footnote, when Cooper died five years later, Irving, who Cooper had labeled as below the ordinary level in moral qualities, graciously agreed to serve as the head of the committee that prepared the memorial and dinner in Cooper's honor. He also did so for free. There was no animosity, though, between uh, Irving and another popular American writer, Nathaniel Hawthorne. In 1852, Hawthorne, whose motives were decidedly purer than Edgar Allan Poe's, sends Irving an advanced copy of the Wonder Book uh, as a token of friendship. Irving writes a genuine letter of thanks back to Hawthorne. He says, I prize it as the right hand of fellowship extended to me by one whose friendship I am proud and happy to make, and whose writings I have regarded with admiration as among the very best that have ever issued from the American praise, the American press. Well, Hawthorne responds with what you can only describe as a gushing fan letter. Hawthorne says, your friendly and approving word was one of the highest gratifications that I could possibly have received from any literary source. It affords me, and I ask no more, an opportunity of expressing the affectionate admiration which I have long felt so long. A feeling, by the way, common to all of our countrymen in reference to Washington Irving, and which I think you can hardly appreciate, because there is no writer with the qualities to awaken in yourself Precisely the same intellectual and heartfelt recognition. Well, now into his 60s, Irving is still working. He's writing a multi-volume biography of George Washington. He's making regular trips to Washington, D.C. to plumb the archives at Mount Vernon and the State Department. Typical of a celebrity, on one train ride down to the district, he runs into William Makepeace Thackeray, who's on his way to Philadelphia on his own book tour. Uh, Irving says, we took seats beside each other in our cars and passed the morning off delightfully. Only Irving will run into William Makepeace Thackeray on the train. While Irving's appearances in Washington, D.C. were always less productive than he was hoping, mainly because he was mobbed wherever he went. Attending a White House reception with President Miller Fillmore, for example, his presence starts a sensation. Irving says, I had to shake hands with man, woman, and child who beset me on all sides until I felt as if it was becoming rather absurd. But the press were impressed. The happiness of having pressed his hand will be among the cherished recollections of the hundreds who clustered around him at the president's reception, the newspaper said. As Irving passed the age of 70 in 1853, he was untouchable. Reviews for a new book of his, Wolfert's Roost, which was a collection of short stories, the reviews were now more about Washington Irving than they were about the book. Uh, reviews were so glowing, though, that Irving actually cried as he read the positive reviews. Um, as his friend, Senator <coughs> William Preston, explained to him, I have often had an enhanced consideration when it was known that I had been an acquaintance of Washington Irving. For I don't believe that any man in any country has ever had a more affectionate admiration for him than that given to you in America. Newspapers are following his health now. Uh, Irving is thrown from his favorite horse, a skittish horse named uh, Gentleman Dick. Escapes with no real injuries, but the newspapers are in a dither and report his condition with typical overstatement, and Irving spends several days writing letters to friends telling them to disregard the accounts in the paper. He says they were, as usual, exaggerated. So the media is continuing to follow Irving's progress as he gets older. Irving's doing the best to keep up with the fan mail that seems to just flow into Sunnyside now. He says, oh, these letters, these letters, they tear my mind from me in slips and ribbons. Uh, yet he continues to answer his correspondence. Irving completed his biography on George Washington in May 1859. And in early November, Irving conducted what would be his last press interview anywhere with the New York Independent. His exhaustion at this point is obvious. He's 76 years old. He says, I shall never take up the pen again. I have so entirely given up writing that even my best friend's letters lie unanswered. I must have rest. No more books now. 20 days after giving that interview, uh, on November 29, 1859, 
Irving died of a heart attack at age 76 at home in Sunnyside in his bedroom. The telegraph carried the words, Washington Irving is dead across the nation. Who was there that the tidings did not touch with profound sorrow the Milwaukee Sentinel asked the next day? Well, if we need any further evidence of Irving's iconic status, we need to look no further than December 1st, 1859, the day of Irving's burial. Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow were swapped in black. Mourners stepped off the train platform at Irvington, formerly Dearman, named after Washington Irving, under a black draped sign. Businesses in Terrytown were closed for the day. Uh, government offices in New York City were closed, allowing government officials to attend Irving's funeral. At 12.30 uh, p.m., church bells rang across the city of New York, and a line of carriages pulled away from Irving's house in Sunnyside, carrying his body, the pallbearers, his family, and other mourners. Irving was buried that day on a hillside in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery overlooking the old Dutch church. There is no epitaph on Irving's grave. Uh, even at the end, Irving, the most famous man in America, had again declined to make a speech. His legacy ultimately is for you here to decide. Thank you very much. Maybe a nice conversation, <laughs> and then I had dinner. It, 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 he's just, I'm, 
the example that I kept using at one point, it's not great, but the, it's, it's almost like Forrest Gump in the sense that if there's anybody famous around, he's there. If there's going on, he's there. I mean, he's, you know, he's in Spain in the Spanish Civil War. He's there when Van Buren's re, you know, nomination is rejected. He's had a knack for being in all the right, exciting places at his time. I ran into uh, Edwin Albee on the bus the other day. <laughs>
A lot of his letters and papers are here in New York. The New York Public Library has quite a few of them. Sunnyside manages quite a few of them. So a lot of his stuff is still around, and they continue to find stuff almost regularly in the attics and so on. I ran into someone in New York, who back me on this, who said she's found some of the papers of Henry Reward, which I would love to get my hands on. In there. So, uh, so stuff is continuing to be found. But a great deal of the, re as far as his papers and, and journals, um, have been collected over even the last hundred years and finally kind of parsed and teased apart by the uh, University of Wisconsin. Stanley Williams did a lot of that early work in the early 1900s. But, uh, Stanley Williams is also the guy who wrote the 1935 <laughs> uh, biography of Irving, where if you get through the first volume and wonder why he even chose the topic, because he clearly can't stand Washington Irving. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you get that he thinks Irving's a bum, he thinks he's lazy, which probably was, but he thinks he's a hack, which he certainly wasn't. And uh, I was compared to another biography I love is The Many Lives of John Lennon by Albert Goldman, which is a train wreck of a book that you can't stop reading because it's just so, you know, so horrible. And, but all you wonder is, God, why did you pick to write 900 pages of someone you hate? And that was kind of the way the Stan Williams book was. That was one of the reasons I wanted to look at Irving again, is because that Williams book just could not clearly stand him. So, um, huh? Um, can you describe how a love the dreamer um, blesses uh, and he's the St. Nicholas as the uh, saint of New York, and how that sort of inspired the whole Christmas. Yeah, there's a, there's a, Irving actually, in 1812, the History of New York was a book that Irving went back to whenever he needed money. It seemed like, and every time Irving came up short on cash, he said, I'm going to issue another edition of History of New York. <laughs> so in 1812, he went back and modified the History of New York, and he inserted a new section in there. It was a dream sequence with all out the dreamer, and in that dream sequence, he talks about St. Nicholas dragging his wagon across the rooftops. Well, this is sort of the Neanderthal version of Santa Claus. Uh, and Irving actually contributed hugely to the American view of Christmas. If you read in the sketchbook, there's five short stories in the middle of the sketchbook called Old Christmas. And it's about, it's about Irving's narrator, Jeffrey Graham, pulling up in a stagecoach in front of Bracebridge Hall with the Bracebridge children. He gets invited in for Christmas dinner. to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with it. And he describes... You know, good-looking couples dancing in these mansions crammed with antique furniture, and nobody can describe food or beer quite as well as Washington Irving. <laughs> and, you know, people eating lots of food and dancing and telling ghost stories, and here's the Yule log, and here's the bowl of wassail and the big silver bowl, and here's Christmas greens. Camp. And Irving writes all this stuff, and people in the book are saying, God, you know, Squire Bracebridge really knows how to celebrate Christmas. This is, <laughs> this is the old style of Christmas. This is the way it's always been done. No, it wasn't. Washington Irving made all of that up. Frank Warren Dickens influenced. Well, he definitely influenced Dickens, but Washington Irving made all of that up, and uh, Americans read that and went, wow, this is the way Christmas needs to be celebrated. This is the old way of celebrating Christmas. <laughs> so Americans kind of wrapped their arms around that and adopted those, saying, we're celebrating the old style of Christmas. But we're really not. We're celebrating the old style of Christmas as interpreted by Washington Irving. <laughs> but it works because Irving told you it did. Um, <laughs> And that was actually how I kind of backed into that. I loved those Christmas stories. That was how I found him, uh, was through the Christmas stories. But uh, he, that went a long way toward influencing Charles Dickens, for example, who read those Christmas stories and kind of adopted that atmosphere for his Christmas stories. Uh, and I don't think it's any coincidence that when, before he wrote A Christmas Carol, Dickens had visited Irving at home in Sunnyside with his brother Ebenezer Irving. So I, I don't think it's a stretch <laughs> maybe see a little bit more of an influence there on Dickens and Christmas. So. We actually have an Ebenezer Irving descendant over here. Really? Right over here in the book. One, uh, one more question. One more question.
it's, it's one of those fun moments in Irving's life. Um, you know, he wasn't terribly interested in pursuing that. But even she, to some extent, I think, was kind of goofing around a little bit. It, it, that relation, that occurred very close to the time right after Percy Shelley had died. And she was kind of holed up in London, and a lot of her friends were saying, you really need to go out and socialize more. And so she'd been, you know, socializing with John Howard Payne, but she'd seen Irving at the theater. So, and I think she was, you know, very interested in exploring a relationship. I don't know how head over heels she necessarily was at the time, but, um, you know, her letters are typical Mary Shelley letters, very smart, very funny. Um, as you can see, the whole antediluvian reference. I mean, very, you know, she was, she was, she was a pretty sharp cookie, but uh, I... I, I don't know how far she was going to be willing to go. The bit about marrying Irving, even she kind of knew that was a joke. But more than anything, she really wanted those letters. Uh, and she said something to Payne about, uh, you know, I'm hoping his handwriting will become as familiar to me as Lord Byron's was. So, I mean, she really got a lot out of having his letters. That meant a lot to her. But again, Irving, you know, annoyingly just said, well, I'll write her letters and went to bed. I mean, just, he never said another word about it. <clears throat> Can we do one more? Uh, right here. Oh, over here, I thought you were um. Yes, Irving was self-taught, uh, which is amazing. I mean, the opening line of my book is Washington Irving was a dunce, because his entire life he frustrated every teacher he ever had by his inability to focus. Um, you know, he was more interested in reading, you know, Daniel Defoe and things like that than he was reading, reading the classics. He wanted to read you know, pulp novels essentially. But um, when he got over to um, when he got over to London, partly at Walter Scott's request, he started teaching himself German so he could read German folklore. And there's a lot of German folklore in the sketchbook, for example. Ruth Van Winkle, is, uh, there's some German folklore there. So he taught himself German so he could read German. Uh, he taught himself Spanish, very fluent in Spanish. He, when he was living in Dresden, the Foster family, he would take Italian lessons from them. So he was always kind of dabbling in languages. Um, um, I've heard that he was fluent in Dutch. I was never able to completely run that one down. But um, he was clearly was, uh, you know, very interested in languages and picked them up very quickly. It's really impressive when you see how many languages are. You, it, again, it's always a throwaway. I'm standing here in my room waiting for a layer to come and I'm trying to, you know, figure out German verbs while I'm doing it. But he, um, you know, he was never afraid to learn the languages and a lot of times it was just self-taught. Uh, again, Italian, a couple of the other, uh, French he, he taught himself. Uh, you know, I think a lot, a big part of it is it's no fun to socialize in Paris if you can't speak French. So he'd be learning languages a lot for that. But in German, when it came to that, he really, he did that mainly because he really wanted to read German folklore in its original language. So. But mostly self-taught on that, which I'm sure would have astounded all of his early teachers. Thank you.